policy, improved national standards and procedures, and indeed the establishment of a national unit, as has been referred to. Uh, that ends general questions time. We now move to First Minister's question. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, now we're getting into the afternoon. Can I ask the First Minister what engagements is planned for the rest of the day? Cabinet Secretary. Okay. Uh, First Presiding Minister. Officer, can I take the, uh, the opportunity, since this is the uh, first First Minister's question, since to, to thank the, the people of Glasgow, every member of Team Scotland, all of their support yeah. staff, our wonderful Clydesiders for all of their efforts in making the Commonwealth Games a magnificent show for yeah. the people of Scotland. Yeah. to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. John Lennon. Thank you. And of course, as someone who's lived and breathed the Commonwealth Games for the last 10 years, eh, both as a, a family member and a citizen of Glasgow, I would, of course, join with the First Minister in endorsing everything he has said about what a wonderful, a wonderful spectacle Glasgow and Scotland put on for the rest of the Commonwealth and the world. In the increasingly unlikely event that Scotland votes yes... And in the likely event that the First Minister is unable to agree a currency union with the rest of the United Kingdom, could the First Minister tell the people of Scotland what is Plan B? First Minister. Well, uh, she'll, uh, she'll find uh, the answer on page 110 <laughs> and page 111 of the white paper putting forward to the people of Scotland. But can I, I say to Joan Lamont that the reason we are keeping the pound in a currency union and the reason we are so unambiguous about it is because we are appealing to the greatest authority of all, that is the sovereign will of the people of Scotland. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And after a yes vote in the referendum, I'm sure that Joan Lamont will be among those who accept that sovereign will of the people of Scotland. It's Scotland's pound. It doesn't belong to George Osborne. It doesn't belong to Ed Balls. It's Scotland's pound, and we're keeping it. Joanne Lemon. Well, I don't know what Nicola Sturgeon made of that answer, but I dare say I shall read what she thought from an unnamed source in tomorrow's papers. So let me try again. Let me try again. Maybe I shall have more success than Alistair Darling in this regard. The First Minister has said on many occasions that he has a plan B, C, D, E and F if there isn't a currency union. It is clear then he has at least entertained the possibility that the currency union might not, not happen. So he claims to have a range of other options. Please share with us what is Plan B? First Minister. Well, the, the options are on page 110 of the White Paper. Uh, uh, these are for the euro, which we don't support, uh, a fixed or flexible exchange rate policy, perfectly viable, but not as good as keeping sterling. Uh, and it also points out we cannot be stopped from keeping the pound yeah. because it's an internationally tradable currency. So now that I've had to inform Joanne Lamont of the uh, page 110 of the White Paper, will she not accept that the reason that the White Paper puts forward the view of keeping sterling in a formal currency union, it's best for Scotland, it's best for the rest of the United Kingdom, yes. it's our pound and we're keeping it. Joanne Lamont. That might convince your backbenchers. It will not convince anybody who lives in the real world. Because, of course, of course, the First Minister talks about his sovereign mandate. He talks about Scotland's sovereign mandate. But the Prime Minister of the rest of the United Kingdom will have a sovereign mandate to say no. It is not. It is not. It is not. Order! Order! Let us hear Ms Lamont. It's not for the first, first Minister, no matter how limitless he thinks his powers are, to determine what is in the national interest of another 
country. That is not within his gift to decide. The First Minister had been told by all the relevant UK politicians and the civil servant running the Treasury that there will not be a currency union. The First Minister has said he has a range of other options. Now, I do hope, I do hope that the currency is not like the EU legal advice he said he had, when in fact he didn't. So let's take the First Minister at his word when he said he had a plan B. Can he please just share with us and tell us what it is? First Minister. I, 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 just, I, I just listed the four options on page 110 of the, of the white paper. I, I was interested. Order. I was interested in John Lambert citing the Prime Minister of the nation saying no, but isn't that exactly what Gordon Brown, the previous Prime Minister, warned about in the Daily Record of the 2nd of June? He said if the only propaganda that comes from the Conservatives is Britain says no, it's bound to have a reaction in Scotland. It's bound to make people feel they're talking down to us or are not taking seriously or are trying to bully us. So perhaps Joanne Lambert should take the advice of the previous Prime Minister as opposed to taking this better together, no alliance and citing David Cameron, the Tory Prime Minister. I, I think there's three reasons uh, why what the Prime Minister and George Osborne and Dead Balls say now and what they say the day after a yes vote in the referendum are two entirely different things. Firstly, there is the sovereign will of the Scottish people, and many people will respect that sovereign will of the Scottish people. Secondly, this plan is in the best interest of Scotland, but it's also in the best interest of the rest of the United Kingdom. Yes, Businesses in the rest of the United Kingdom will not want to pay £600 million in trans transaction costs. Uh, and thirdly, of course, the, uh, Osborne Balls and the Prime Minister are not saying they can stop us using the pound. They are saying now that they want to keep for themselves the asset of the Bank of England, nationalised in 1946, an asset and a bank which holds some 26% of UK debt. But if you keep all of the assets of the United Kingdom, you end up with all of the liabilities of the United Kingdom. Which, which amounts after the work of George Osborne and Alistair Darling, amount to £1.3 trillion pounds of debt. So we're expected Order. to believe that next year Order. in the UK general election, George Osborne and Ed Balls are going to campaign round England and say the people of Scotland want to take their share of that liability, but we want to keep the Bank of England. We want to give them a present of £5 billion pounds a year that's why the best interests of Scotland, the sovereign will of the Scottish people will prevail. It's our pound and we're keeping it. Joanne Lamont. I'm not surprised that the First Minister is quoting from the Daily Record in June rather than the Daily Record this morning. You know, three times today and for many, many times in the last two years, I've asked the First Minister about his plans for the currency. This is a serious matter for the people of Scotland. And each time, each time, I get a response, but never an answer to the questions that people are asking. It is clear, it is clear, the First Minister has a strategy to get Scotland to leave the United Kingdom. But what is becoming increasingly clear is he doesn't have a plan for Scotland. We remember, we remember, for those of us who remember what the First Minister used to say, once the pound was a millstone round Scotland's neck, then the euro was Scotland's choice. His former deputy, Jim Sillers, says we should have a separate Scottish currency and the F First Minister's plan is stupidity on stilts. The First Minister says he has a range of options and a plan B, C, D, E and F. Don't the people of Scotland deserve to know which one it will be? And if he doesn't tell us, which one will it be? And if he doesn't tell us, isn't it clear that while he may have a plan to break up the United Kingdom, he doesn't have a plan for Scotland or the future of families across this country? First Minister. 
All right. They, Order, I, I, I did First point Minister. Out that the options were contained in page 110 of the White Paper. I pointed out it was the Euro. Yes. Well, I answered this question two questions ago. I pointed out it was the Euro, which we don't support. I pointed out the fixed or flexible exchange yes. rate, which are perfectly viable but not as good as keeping sterling in a formal currency union. I pointed out you, you cannot be stopped from using yep. our own currency. Yes. That is not even the position of the Conservative Party. You cannot be stopped Order. from using sterling. All of these things, not just I've done twice today, but are in page 110 of the White Paper. We are putting forward the position that they were appealing to the people of Scotland and their sovereign will in a referendum, which is why we are unambiguous. We think the best position for Scotland, the best position for the rest of the United Kingdom, is to have a formal currency union. Therefore, it is our pound, and we are keeping it in the interests of the Scottish people. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Order. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I add the heartfelt thanks of myself and my party to those of the First Minister, to everyone who helped put on such a fantastic Commonwealth Games in Glasgow? Yeah. And can I add also to those mentioned all of the police and the armed forces that help keep Scots and visitors safe throughout the duration of the Games? Um, and can I ask the First Minister when he will next meet the Prime Minister? First Minister. Uh, no plans, near future. Ruth Davidson. Running officer, the First Minister is trying to lead the Scottish public up the garden path here because he's trying to pretend to people that he can deliver a currency union with the rest of the UK if there were to be independence. And he knows that he can't. The First Minister often likes to pretend that he speaks for all of Scotland, but he's now claiming to speak for all of England, all of Wales and all of Northern Ireland too. So can we all just take a step back and can he admit to the people of Scotland in this chamber right now that if there were to be a yes vote, a currency union is not in his gift to give? Yeah. First Minister. Well, I, I've just set out the reasons uh, why I think what is said the day after a yes vote in the referendum is different from what's been said now. I, I accept that apparently George Osborne uh, and the Prime Minister have drawn a line in the sand on this matter. <laughs> But as Ruth Davidson well knows, lines in the sand have a habit of being washed away. Yeah. Therefore, I welcomed Ruth Davidson's revelation in the 15th of June this year in the Sunday Post that she will back a currency union in the event of a yes vote if that is what is best for Scotland. Now, I can only assume that Ruth Davidson is responding as Joanne Lamont didn't seem to that she would accept the sovereign will of the Scottish people. Mind you, there's less enthusiasm than there is from the deputy leader, Jackson Carlow, sitting alongside her. On the 21st of February, he said after a yes vote, he would man the barricades for the pound after independence. Can I say to Ruth Davidson and to Jackson Carlow, I'll be there on the barricades with the Conservative Party. Ruth Davidson. A slightly kamikaze approach to be quoting newspapers today, First Minister. We can all trade quotes, but you're so predictable that I have the uh, reference that you're referring to in June. I think we've got to look at what is best for Scotland. I think that monetary union we have is the best option for Scotland, yeah. which is why I'm fighting to keep it as part of the United Kingdom. That was the actual quote I gave. But the First Minister's answer... Just settle down, Ms Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. So, so far we've had a nonsense on skilts argument that a sovereign will will make this happen. And if the First Minister's preferred option was a link with the dollar, a yes vote from Scotland doesn't mean Barack Obama has to submit to the sovereign will to have a currency union there. And his other argument has been that it's in the rest of the UK's interest to have a currency union. Well, let's look at this, because the vast majority of the people in England and Wales said in June that it's not in their interest. The First Minister of Wales has said it's not in their interest. The Permanent Secretary of the Treasury has said it's not in England, Wales or Northern Ireland's interest. The Chancellor, the Shadow Chancellor, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury have said it's not in their interest. The markets have said it's not in their interest. 
But I didn't ask the First Minister to tell me anything about sovereign will or what's in the best interest of the rest of the UK. I asked him whether a currency union was in his gift. It's not. And all the wishing in the world doesn't make it so. So if he can't deliver, presiding officer, and he can't, we are back where we started, needing a preferred plan B. Not a range of options, a preferred plan B. He must have one, so what is it? Yeah. First Minister. I, I, I've listed the currency options twice to Joanne Lambert for page 110 of the, yeah. of the white paper. I, I, can, I, I can certainly do it again, but I've done it twice, as the record will show. Uh, and talking about records, I, I think Ruth Davidson might come to regret uh, only reading out that quote and not going a couple of lines down, because she was then asked... She was then asked what would happen if Scotland voted yes for independence. And she said that she would back a currency union if that is what was best for Scotland. The Sunday Post, 15th of June. She said, well, you know, honest, well Ruth, the, the, record, Davidson, the record is Ms. there Davidson. and the full quotation is there, as she very well knows, what happened when she was then asked what would happen in the event of a, a yes vote. And I, I anticipated that that was because she acknowledged the importance of the sovereign will of the Scottish people. I've also said it's not as enthusiastic as manning the barricades with her deputy leader <laughs> sitting alongside her, but nonetheless, it's quite important. Now, Ruth Davidson tries to give the impression that you know, this argument that it's best for the rest of the UK is something which is held by myself and myself alone, despite the very substantial arguments. I noticed a letter in the Financial Times from Jim Spowart, who is the head of uh, Intelligent Finance, uh, Professor David Simpson, a highly distinguished Scottish economist, Angus Tuller, Michelle Thompson, Professor Sir Donald Mackay, 25 years advisor to the Secretary of State for Scotland, Sir George Matheson and James Scott, former Chief Executive of Scottish Financial Exercise. He said there's a positive outlook for the financial sector because the likelihood of a currency union is strong. It is not only in the best interests of Scotland and the rest of the UK, but of our financial sector industry. I said earlier on that the issue was not whether Scotland could keep the pound. I assume Ruth Davidson accepts, as Alistair Darling did the other night, that it cannot be prevented from keeping the pound. We can't be prevented from keeping an internationally tradable currency. And I would like to say also that in terms of the, the debt, I mean, there's no doubt now because the Treasury has accepted full liability for the debt, but presumably in reasonableness, the Conservative debt. Party, the <coughs> Unionist Coalition will accept if the Conservatives, if the Westminster Government tries to keep all of the assets of the United Kingdom, <laughs> like the Bank of England, then they end up lumbered with the debt. And the point I was making, it seems to me incredible that Ed Balls and George Osborne will go round campaigning in a UK general election telling the people of England that they were offered up to five billion of debt interest payments by a reasonable proposition put forward by the people of Scotland, but they don't want it because they want to have exclusive control of the Bank of England. That is why what they say now and what they say the day after a yes vote are two entirely different things. That is why it's our pound and we are keeping it. Constituency question, Dave Stewart. Yeah. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be well aware that Circle will be closing their call centre in Brora and will make all 21 local workers redundant. This is a devastating blow to the small rural community with a population of only 1,200. Will the First Minister agree to meet me and send a beacon of hope to all the affected families in the north? First yeah, Minister. I'll certainly uh, arrange uh, for that meeting. Uh, I saw the uh, announcement. I know that Mr Swinney and his officials have been engaged already on these matters. But certainly I'll meet David Stewart and his constituents because I agree with them that while well, 21 jobs uh, can for, uh, be sound like a, a relatively small number, in a small rural community proportionately it's a, a huge number. Uh, and I think that these things and these matters have to be a real concern for companies when making such announcements. Uh, and therefore, we want to be sure that the views of David's constituents are fully taken into account uh, as we discuss with CERCO how we can move forward on this, this issue. Question three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First uh, Minister. Issues of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. 
Does the First Minister accept that he's not been fair to people in Scotland? He says he's got an alternative currency plan, but yet the First Minister can't even bring himself to describe the consequences. After a lifetime of campaigning for independence, when the big moment of truth came on Tuesday, he couldn't explain his currency plan in front of a million people. Surely he should have another go at an answer now. People in Scotland don't get another go in September. So please, can he describe the consequences to Scotland of his alternative plan? First minute. Well, uh, I've laid out uh, page 110 of the White Paper that you could have the euro, which we don't support, although uh, previously the Liberal Democrats and myself supported it. You could have a fixed and flexible exchange rate, perfectly viable, but not as good as the option that's being put forward as Plan A in the White Paper. Uh, we cannot be prevented from using sterling, using the pound as our currency. We cannot be prevented from keeping it. I've also pointed out the reason the White Paper puts it forward in these terms is we're looking for the sovereign will of the Scottish people to back the plan to keep sterling in that currency union. And I know that, as a Liberal Democrat, that uh, uh, Willie Rennie will be first, if not to man the barricades, then to accept that the sovereign will of the Scottish people should prevail. That's why it's in the White Paper, that's why we're backing it, and that's why it's our pound, and we are keeping it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Willie he knows those page numbers off by heart, but he can't give the answer to the question. The First Minister often, the First Minister often refers to the Fiscal Commission, but I suspect most people don't have a copy of the Fiscal Commission handy at home. Their names aren't on the leaflets sent to every house. People don't know what they're recommending. They don't knock on the doors. The First Minister does. They're supposed to be his ideas. What are they? And why can't he bring himself to give us a description of the consequences of his alternative? Why can't he give an answer? First Minister. I, I mean, I, I'm glad that Willie Rennie mentioned the Fiscal Commission, of course, uh, two Nobel laureates, two highly distinguished uh, economists. But I wasn't quoting from the Fiscal Commission. I was quoting from the white paper presented to the people of Scotland in page 110. If I remember right, Willie Rennie was complaining about the amount we were spending promoting the, the white paper and giving the information to the people of Scotland. How can he complain about it on the one hand and say that this information is not now uh, uh, available? In terms of, of consequences of other currency uh, options, uh, Professor David Bell, when he gave evidence to this Parliament's committee, pointed out, quote, it is the UK debt, not Scottish debt, and the UK has agreed it will pay back the debt. That is the first thing to say. You see, it might be extremely attractive if for Scotland to be in a position where the UK seized the financial assets but weren't prepared to accept that that means they have the liabilities as well. It would be extremely attractive for Scotland to be debt-free, would be in balance of payments and budget surplus, but it's not a reasonable position to put forward, which is why in the white paper, in the articulation, that we are offering to pay our fair share, finance our fair share of the massive liabilities built up by the likes of George Osborne, but that is dependent, of course, and properly, on having a fair share of the assets as well. That's an entirely reasonable, responsible proposition. It's the proposition which is in the White Paper. That is why, as part of a formal currency union, it's our pound, and we intend to keep it. Question number four, Ailey McLeod. Ailey McLeod. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what impact privatisation of the NHS in England will have on the budget available to the Scottish Government. First Minister. Well, uh, extremely serious. Uh, as people in this chamber will know, our budget for public services in Scotland is currently allocated as a relative proportion of the spending in England as determined by the Barnett formula. Now, the impact of an austerity and privatisation agenda being forced on the NHS in England will consequently see our budget eroded. For every £10 lost to the NHS in England, Scotland will lose approximately a pound in funding for public services. So it's a serious question, a serious issue. Uh, and therefore, the idea that we can be immune from the privatisation agenda being pursued by the National Health Service, by the government in England, is not, is not reasonable in terms of how Scotland is financed. And the way to 
defend the National Health Service. Our public National Health Service is to have control of Scotland's finances uh, and therefore not vulnerable to the privatisation and fragmentation carried forward in England. Ely McLeod. First Minister therefore agree with me that the only way that we can protect Scotland's NHS from Westminster's ongoing austerity cuts and privatisation agenda and ensure that it remains true to its founding principle of health care, free at the point of need and remains firmly in public hands, is by voting yes on the 18th of September. First Minister. Yes, I do. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, of expressions of that, I think uh, Dr Philippa Whitford, somebody who, as far as I know, has never been involved in politics before, but one of Scotland's prominent breast surgeons who has spoken out so articulately on this issue, exactly because she can see the danger to the National Health Service in Scotland, which is the consequence of privatisation uh, south of the border. We are fortunate in Scotland that we have policy control of health. That's allowed us to protect our health service from the deeply damaging so-called reforms that Westminster governments have made to the NHS in England, or not just over the last two or three years, over the last 15 years. Yeah. Now, while devolution, we can set a different policy. But without independence, our budget will be beholden to the whims of a privatisation agenda. That's why, to protect Scotland's national public yeah. health service, we need independence and control yeah. of Scotland's finances. Given that the Scottish Government has received £1.3 billion by its own admission in consequentials from Westminster, specifically for health in this Parliament alone, can the First Minister confirm when during the summer recess the Scottish Government's referendum advice became so desperate that Ministers felt their only recourse was to indulge in malicious, unsubstantiated, shameful and shabby scaremongering about the future of Scotland's wholly devolved NHS as a public service, to which every party, every party in this Parliament is profoundly committed. First Minister. They seem to have touched the raw nerve of the no campaign. And certainly we're going to take no lectures on scaremongering from a no campaign that's entirely based on scaremongering for the Scottish people. The position is clear. A Jackson Carlaw of all people, since he previously believed in fiscal autonomy for Scotland, understands it and understands it full well. He knows that every penny piece of consequentials for the health service has been passed on to the health service in Scotland. He also knows that the entire purpose of a privatisation agenda is to reduce expenditure, public expenditure on the health service. Therefore, it follows if expenditure is reduced in England and we are still part of the Barnet formula, then there will be less money available for public services in Scotland. That is why. The threat to Scotland's public health service is real unless we control Scotland's finances in the way that he once believed in and we believe in and the people of Scotland will back on the 18th September. Question 5, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to First ScotRail being fined more than £2 million since 2011 for running too few coaches in a practice known as short forming? First Minister. No, that is, it's a, a serious question, but I think we should remember that 99.7% of trains ran with the planned capacity this year, and that 0.3% of the journeys did not meet capacity. Now, that, in anybody's terms, is a strong performance, and it's also a performance that's significantly better uh, than when the previous administration were in charge. In 2007, for example, the penalties of which uh, Mark Griffin spoke, spoke about for not meeting capacity totaled more than £830,000. The figure now stands at £574,000, which is a drop of 31% on the Labour record. Now, I and I hope everyone in this chamber would like to see that at 100%, not at 99.7%. But I think, in fairness, Mark Griffin should deflect that the record this year, for which he is rightly concerned, is significantly better than when his party were in office. Mark Griffin. Does the First Minister agree that a publicly owned rail operator with interest of customers and services before profit would be best placed to address issues such as short forming? 
Will he support proposals outlined originally in Scottish Labour's Devolution Commission, now adopted by the UK Labour Party, to allow publicly owned companies to bid for the ScotRail franchise? And does he agree that it's a good example of a progressive Scotland working within the UK, leading to more progressive policies across Britain? First well, Minister. It's a, a, a pity that uh, he didn't think of changing the, the law when you were in government uh, in this yeah. chamber. But he'll have noted that uh, I've spoken out publicly that I think the publicly provided West Coast service uh, should be able to bid publicly for that, uh, for that line. It also should be noted for that the rail network has a 90% satisfaction rating among passengers. That compares to 82% of the, for the rest of the UK. There is still a lot more to be done, both in terms of what Mark Griffin has examined, uh, but also the investment in the rail network, including £430 million in new rolling stock to fund the 38 new Class 380 trains. So I know and understand Mark Griffin's concerns, uh, but I think he will agree that there is substantial reasonable level of satisfaction in the progress that is being made, albeit there is still more progress to be made. Question 6, Bob Doris. Mr First Minister, what the Scottish Government's position is on the Credit Suisse Research Institute report on the success of small states? First Minister. I welcome the report by Credit Suisse Research, which highlights the very strong performance of small independent countries across a, a whole range of social and economic measures. The importance of the, the UN Human Development Index is it doesn't just look at economic performance alone. It looks across the, the range of social and economic criteria to evaluate and say how states should be judged. But this report adds to uh, a great chorus of voices who agree that Scotland can be a successful independent nation. For example, Credit Suisse estimate in that report that Scotland would be ranked ahead of the UK on the UN Development Index. Bob Doris. Thank the First Minister for that answer. Is aware that two key findings in the report are that economies of scale for larger countries does not necessarily benefit their population, and that it is less costly to fund public services in a small country rather than a large one. Does the First Minister agree that this report directly contradicts the scaremongering of the likes of Alistair Darling, who could not even bring himself to admit that Scotland could be a prosperous and successful independent nation? First Minister. Well, uh, 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 of course, that, uh, the report adds a great deal of strength to the view that there is a, a substantial body of evidence that uh, small countries in Europe and beyond are extremely successful economically. Uh, I, I think we are reaching a, a, a consensus in these matters, are we not? We are reaching a consensus that Scotland can be a successful independent country. Yeah. And there is nobody in this chamber, surely, is going to disagree with that point. If everybody is disagreeing with that point, then they should speak up now. Scotland can be a successful independent country. Well, I take that as unanimity in this chamber. So let the message go out to the people of Scotland that now we've established we can be. The question to be answered on September the 18th is should we be? And I think it will be a yes answer. That ends First Minister's question. That ends First Minister's question time. We now move to the next item of business. The next item of business is uh, a member's debate. Uh, members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly, and I'll give a few moments to make sure that happens.